Andrew Heinzman is an author, a publisher, and the president of Investico, the first environmentally oriented investment company in Canada. He's the author of The New Entrepreneurs, Building a Green Economy for the Future. The book is a fascinating tour of evolving green enterprises in such vital fields as forestry, water, energy, transportation, and agriculture. We have undervalued, by undervaluing our, our commonly owned property, uh, we've created an incentive for po people to overuse it. And, and uh, you know, the, the, there's a rich sort of story behind that, and it was a, a concept introduced by William Foster Lloyd in early 1800s, and it's now percolated out as a, you know, and I think it, it Hawken doesn't actually call it the tragedy of the commons, but I, I see this sort of the same fundamental issue, which is that the market economy as we've, cr cr as we've created it uh, has this flaw. It's got this imperfection, and uh, it creates an incentive for people to overuse resources because the, the resources aren't properly uh, costed, and, and so the, you know, the accounting system isn't working, basically. And so that's, to me, the... You know, it's actually a relatively simple problem in some respects, uh, and we know what it is. And it's, and to me, it's the greatest response or, or you know, caveat to Adam Smith's invisible hand. You know, this notion of a free market economy and, and creating, you know, all these benefits for for the participants, individuals in the economy. The tragedy of the commons is the greatest pushback, and it's the one we have had the greatest trouble in in uh, in remedying. And uh, so that, to me, that's kind of the starting point. Uh, for my whole way of, of seeing this, this challenge, both in terms of the role of the entrepreneurs and the roles of, of governments in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, getting to that design problem and, and figuring a way to solve it. When you do that, when you set some constraints on and, and you set up a carbon tax and you basically make the box a little tighter around the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur responds with innovation. There's a thing it's called the innovation effect and, and if, if regulation can be imposed in, in certain ways, it actually creates economic growth through through innovation, and, and I think it's a really important principle because people have to. I think they have to believe that when we impose environmental costs on the society, um, they actually it, it's not to our economic detriment. I mean, I, I think if people, if if we always let the environment and the economy, you know, be uh, sort of costed against each other, it, the environment will always lose. So we have to change the nature of how we think of it. And I think there's now ample evidence that uh, putting those constraints on creates innovation. And, and in resource-based economies like Canada, it's critical to have that innovation express, be expressed. So I, I think hopefully over time people start to see, yeah, this is actually good for our economy. This is how we grow. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole bunch of things that have sort of flipped upside down in the transition we're now in. And one of them is that our original thought was resources were essentially endless. And now, even in Canada, we know that they're not. Yeah, it's a fundamental change in, in perspective. If you can imagine yourself as the first Europeans to come here, and they would, and coming from Europe, which you know had uh, much denser populations and, and had you know largely uh, you know cut down a lot of the forests and, and, and already been through that process, they must have looked around and said, "Oh my God, this goes on forever. How could we ever?" how could we ever use all these resources? But of course, you know, over time we saw that uh, there is no finite, infinite resource. They all are fundamentally finite. And so it changes your perspective. This notion that economic growth must be correlated one-to-one -one with energy consumption, I think is you know, provably wrong. You know, um, there's all sorts of examples where you know, we can grow our economies and, and not necessarily grow our energy use at the same rate. And, and we know that innovation applied to things like the efficiency of, of how we use energy has, has tremendous potential. So uh, I, uh, for me, there's no inconsistency to um, economic growth and, uh, and use, reduced use of, of energy or at least greenhouse gas emissions. I sort of imagined, you know, the, this scenario where, you know, in the morning you'd wake up and you'd go out to your car and, the, you know, you would be alerted, you know, that the car's been charged up, that you've got a full enough battery power to get to work and it, you, you've been alerted by that it's sort of, win, you know, probably wind energy which came at night time and, and it probably, you know, repowered your battery at relatively cheap rates. Um, you drive to work. You know, I'd imagine along the way, you know, we're going to have much more efficient kind of mobility systems. So you'll probably be alerted that the most efficient way to get to work. You may even be put into some kind of a grid system on the highways where 
you know, where, where some automatic driving system takes over your, your vehicle for a, for a period. Um, but once you get to work, you know, you, you would uh, plug into a terminal and then you would get notification throughout the day if you wanted to either buy or sell electricity back in from your car into, into the system or you'd probably, more realistic, you'd probably set it and said if it hits a certain price, you know, sell power from my electric car and I'll, bu I'll buy it back at another price. So you're kind of constantly arbitraging the price and, and the utilities are relying on this. this it's basically effectively a resource to, uh, and, and you know, this would could all be enabled through Blackberries or through, through, your, through your internet. And at the end of the day, the, the, the car would make sure, you know, you would have already, it would be alerted where you were driving if you're just driving home. It would know exactly how much, how many electrons you would need for that trip. So it would make sure that you had sufficient electrons and then you would, you know, come, come home. So I sort of imagining this, you know, yeah, it's an it's a interrelationship between the car, the, the electricity system and your, your information uh, systems, your Blackberries and your, your web, you know, web system that work together to create the most efficient use of, of electrons. You know, it, it struck me as, as being just brilliant because it occurred to me if you've got all these millions and millions of cars out there, each one of which is a storage unit for electricity, yeah. then finally you've solved this, this problem you with the intermittent. You don't need, the, ba you don't need the, the big battery anymore. You've got it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. right. That, that, that is the, the potential breakthrough. And now you can have much higher levels of a wind and solar, you know, you know that yeah. that goes that problem of the intermittency goes away. Yeah, yeah that's right. That all just goes into the car's yeah. batteries and it stays there till yeah. it's needed. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Fantastic. Yeah. Andrew Heinzman, president of the Green Investment Company Investico, and author of the New Entrepreneurs: Building a Green Economy for the Future. For the Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time.